So today we're going to talk about permeability. Permeability is uh, chapter seven in your book. And the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is what is permeability? I, you, I know you know a lot about permeability because you already took mechanics of fluids and you discussed that concept before. Um, probably you discussed it in different water courses also. But permeability basically is a measure of how easily a fluid can pass through a porous medium. Of course, in our case, which is geotechnical engineering, the fluid mainly is going to be water and the uh, porous medium is going to be the soil. How permeability occurs, when it happens, well it happens if you have a soil like this, you have empty spaces, aka voids, and then the water can easily pass through those empty spaces. This is a, a loose soil, and as you can see, it's easy to flow, and it has a high permeability. Now, one remember compaction, last chapter that we just covered, one of the objectives of compaction, if you would compact that soil, as reducing and making it uh, more dense, uh, we are reducing the voids, and as we're doing that, then we are also reducing the permeability. That means that in the, in the dense soil, the water or the, the liquid, uh, the fluid, is not as easier to pass and then we refer this soil as a soil with low permeability. Uh, just as a as a indication, uh, I have an animation here, and this animation is going to show you really quick what is the what I'm talking about. Let's say that you have let's say that you have gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Remember this is just an animation and it's approximation also. And you have a column of one meter of gravel. How, how long do you think the water, in this case, is gonna take to go from this point to this point? Answer that question to yourself in your mind, but do it please. So gravel, how much for gravel, how much for sand, how much for silt, and how much for clay? Do you get it? Okay, now if you have that number, uh, it would be nice if you copy it also in your mind, then let's, let's just check a comparison and see what happened. What is happening here? Two minutes after the water is here, the water starts flowing in the sand, two hours, 200 days for the silt, and about 200 years for the clay. I don't think those are the numbers that you were thinking about, but, or did you copy? But if you did, good for you. Uh, that's, that just tells you how important is also the type of soil regarding permeability. The movement of the fluid through the soil in this case is of course uh, described and defined by the Bernoulli's equation, which I know you know also, the Bernoulli's equation. And that equation only uh, describes the movement of that fluid particle. Of course, that fluid particle is gonna go from a higher potential side energy uh, to a lower potential energy, or lower energy, not potential only. And the Bernoulli equation uh, is uh, made out of three parts. The first part is the kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is due to velocity. And then we have the strain energy, and the strain energy is due to the pore pressure. And of course, we have the potential energy, which is just depending on the height of the uh, point that we are studying, referred to a datum, any particular datum. Once again, the Bernoulli's equation uh, if you express now the energy in units of length, aka the head in units of length, then you're gonna have the first part which depends on the velocity and you refer that as the velocity head. The velocity of course in, uh, is a very important part of the movement of the fluid. And that velocity head is V squared divided by two G, you know V the velocity and G the gravity. Now you have to add the pressure head, the or the pore pressure head. The pore pressure head depends on the pressure 
divided by the unit weight of the water. And of course, you divide the pressure by the unit weight of the water, what you're gonna get is the length at the end. And the last part is just the distance Z, which is the elevation head measure on, uh, over the datum that we are selecting there. Now, what happened in the, the soils, basically, is that the velocity is really small. For every type of soils, mm, yes, but no. I mean, yes, but no. Uh, I know it sounds contradicting, but uh, let's say that I have a lot of gravel in the soil. Well, if I have a lot of gravel, that uh, velocity head is not gonna be zero. But usually we don't have that type of situations because in that type of situation, which we check later, basically the Darcy law is not gonna comply also because the flow is not gonna be laminar and this is not what we are uh, dealing with. So for our purposes, let's say that this is gonna be zero and always the total head is gonna be pressure head plus elevation head. Now just some refresh, refresher for, for your mind. Uh, of course, if the flow is from A to B, that indicates that the head at A, the total head of course is gonna be higher than the total head at B because the energy at A has to be bigger than the energy at G at B and also as you can see here there is friction between A and B so the energy is dissipated as the uh, flow of the fluid is going from A to B at any point within the flow regime you know that pressure head is a pore water pressure divided by gamma water elevation head is a height above the selected datum that's it and this measure, this pressure is measured with physiometrics also, and physiometrics, I know you know what they are, but just in case, those are standpipes that can measure the pressure, like this one here. Basically what you do is that you insert this pipe up to the point that you need to, and there is a porous uh, medium here. Um, basically, you can read the column of the water that reaches the water internally in this pipe. Now the loss of head is defined as the difference measure of course in units of length of the energy between or the head between one point and the other point. And this is the typical, the classic Bernoulli experiment. You have a material, in our case soil, contained in this, let's say, pipe. Um, we have to, we measure, or we are able to measure the head here at the point A and the head here at the point B. So basically this is gonna be the difference in head or the loss in head from A to B. Now remember this law, this uh, head at A is defined as several parts. The first part is the height. The total head here is HA and the total head here is HB. Now this HA is comprised of several parts. Velocity is not, uh, an issue here, so because it's really slow. So the first one is the pore water pressure, which is this one for this case, and this one for this case. Uh, that could be the one that you measure with the physiometer. And then the other one is the elevation head, which is the Z measure with respect to the datum, and same with B. So basically, if you just plug this and this into the equation, what you get is just a simple difference head at point A, head at point B. Now there is a way that you can represent uh, that head loss in a non-dimensional way. And I know you also uh, you also saw that before, but anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna refresh it to you. So the way you do that is that basically you divide that difference in length, difference in head by the length that the flow is crossing uh, in other words, uh, you calculate the hydraulic gradient. And the hydraulic gradient is no other thing than the difference in head divided by the length of the flow. Now, uh, this is important because I have seen that uh, there's a really common error in the test. And when a student solves problems, solves situations, 
that they just read L and let L. Oh, okay, L is L. No, L is not any L. L is the length that the flow is going through. In this case, that L corresponds to the length between this point and this point. And look at the mouse, it's going, the pointer is going from here to here, not from here to here. It's not horizontal unless the flow is horizontal. But if the flow is coming inclined like this, this is the L that you need for calculating the hydraulic gradient. And delta H, yes, of course, is the difference in head between these two points. This is what I was telling you uh, some minutes ago. I was telling you that the velocity and the hydraulic gradient, of course, are related, and we know that. Um, if you see the, the plot of that, you have different zones. The first zone is the laminar flow, the second transition zone, and in this part, basically, which is the one that we move, uh, the, and this is the part that I was referring before, but in this part, that is the part that we basically move, in this part, in this zone, the flow is laminar, and in that laminar flow, we know that the velocity is directly proportional to, and when I take velocity, I'm talking about the velocity at the exit also, is directly proportional to the hydraulic gradient. And they are, it, when something is related, is directly proportional to something else, it's because they are related with a constant of proportionality. And that proportionality constant, in this case, is K. That's, how, that's what the Darcy law stated. Darcy law states that because the velocity is directly proportional to the hydraulic gradient, they are related with this proportional constant, and that constant of proportionality is called hydraulic gradient, hydraulic conductivity, or coefficient of permeability. Or just plain and simple, refer as permeability also. As you can see here, if the hydraulic gradient is non-dimensional, well, then the units of K has to be also velocity because this is velocity. Centimeters per second, inches per second, I don't know, that is velocity units. Now if I want to calculate the amount of water flowing from point A to point B through the soil per unit time, that's referred as seepage, small q, and can be determined just as multiplying this V times the cross-sectional area of the material that is, cross, is crossed by the fluid. Remember, cross-sectional area. I want to make emphasis, when I make emphasis in words, it's because those are important and those are huge source for errors in my experience in what I have seen, educational wise. So A has to be cross sectional area perpendicular to the flow. Do you think permeability is important? Well, don't tell me that it's important because you need to learn it for passing this class, which is also true and is important. But the soil permeability and influence in the infiltration rate is directly related with the irrigation strategies, fertilizing strategies, because you don't want that fertilizer to go underground to the uh, bodies of water or wells. Pesticides, same thing. Water quality, ponds, slope stability, soil strength. Quick sense. Wait a second. Quick sense. Yes, quicksand is that is is really uh, affected by the seepage, uh, dikes, dams, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you remember the animation that I showed before with the different type of um, soils and the rate of or uh, the time that the water took to uh, cross it. Now, look at the typical values of hydraulic conductivity of saturated soils. Oh, this is important saturated soils. Everything that we are doing is with saturated soils. And this, everything that we're discussing at this point is with saturated soils. When the soil is not fully saturated, there are other conditions that apply. So for clean gravel, in centimeters per second, the hydraulic conductivity goes around 100 to 1 centimeter per second. But with coarse sand, if you compare this with this, look, we are in two orders of magnitude. Same thing when you go from coarse sand to fine sand, two more. That means that 
between clean gravel and fine sand, we already are in four orders of magnitude of difference. And between fine sand and silty clay, we have here what? Three orders of magnitude. So that's why the time was almost, I, I wouldn't say exponentially, but it went from two minutes to two hours to 200 days to 200 years. Look at the coefficient of permeability. That gives you a pretty good idea of what happened there. Now importance, once again, you have ponds. If you have impermeable soils, there are not a, any loss of water here. If you have, maybe you're gonna have this pond dry because it loses too much water. And the problem is not that it, only that it loses water, it's where the water is going also. Uh, if you have an impermeable, let's say, dam here, or retention dam here, because you have a, a core which is in, Permeable, then you're gonna have no water loss because of these impermeable layers. Is that good, is that bad? I don't know. It, it always depends on what is the design that you did. Because if you did a design that you are hoping, no, you are considering that you have to have a rate of water flowing through, then this is bad. Why is bad? Because I don't know, maybe it keeps raining and the accumulation of water here is so much that it's gonna overflow or it's gonna overturn or it's gonna just destroy it completely and slide it. I don't know, it all depends on what is the design that you're doing and why do you consider the design. Now in other words, in, other, in, in the other case, if you weren't considering that you needed or, or you, you didn't want the, this water loss to occur, and this layer is permeable, then it's gonna be the opposite of this. You're gonna be losing water constantly from that reservoir. Importance, once again, well, this is just an animation, but look at that, you have this little animal here, this little cow, and all the uh, waste from this, or from oil, or from, I don't know, the house, is going underground, and it's going to the wells, and it's affecting everything filtrations. Look at this. This is the seepage. And as you can see, this is concrete, or it looks like concrete. So it didn't happen here. It happened under that. And we are going to learn how to calculate that. If the water cannot go through, it's going to try to come under. And that's really dangerous situation happening there. Uh, what I was showing here, not here, here, this part, let's say, through the dam, uh, you have a simulation here, this point. And it's, it's just a computer animation, you see. You have the water here, and in this part, you can see how the, the seepage is passing through the earth dam, which, by the way, we're gonna learn how to calculate that also. Uh, now imagine that you are in the road like this one, you are going through the road and suddenly uh, this happens to you. Look at that slide in that mountain. expecting it because you see it was barricade here uh, but it wasn't provoked it was something that occurred naturally there infiltration yeah it could be infiltration it might be infiltration I really don't know if it's infiltration or not uh, I'm gonna show you later some something that happened in Venezuela 11 years ago 12 years ago 11 years ago uh, started raining for a long time and it was it was a huge rain it was something in, in two days it, it rained like ten times what it was raining in the rest of the country uh, so the water started infiltrating through the mountain and this is what I was explaining to you before 
and the mountain somehow had like a internal dam made out of clay because it was naturally occurring and the water was accumulating and accumulating and accumulating in the side when the mountain couldn't take anymore the whole mountain came down and I'm talking about 50,000 dead people in that town uh, but I will show you those uh, those scenes later in, a, in, in class probably uh, this is another but this is an experiment now of how no this is not an experiment Well, if you want age defiance, you know what to do now, right? That's how it looks so good. Uh, you see, this is an air dam here happening, and this is simulating just whatever the dam is doing. Of course, this is just sand, and because the process w wanted to be accelerated, but the idea is that you can see the water infiltrating here in this part. You see how it started infiltrating in that part? and it's going, and it's going, and it's going. There. As the time is passing by, look at the water, how it's going now. You can see it, it's almost there. Get out of the, get out of there. Move out, okay. Now you're gonna see immediately when the water reaches this point here, you're gonna see a little bit of water in this angle, and the whole thing is gonna collapse as soon as the water passes by, passes under this part. There, the water is starting to come. Where? You're gonna see it here. As soon as you see some water in this part, there you go. Now the water is coming, and now everything is coming. That's by the way one experiment, one lab that I wanted to, I want to implement here and calculate the actual seepage and the time and everything. Okay, permeability depends on several factors. Some of those factors are, I know you're not gonna answer to me, but you can try to at least. What? Compaction, void ratio, density, what else? Type of soil granulometric distribution, maybe the type of fluid also. Yeah, but in our case, we're dealing supposedly with water, maybe the density of the fluid because we can have salt water or fresh water. Yes, that's a possibility also. What about the viscosity of the fluid? What about the temperature? Yeah, because the temperature affects the viscosity also, and the viscosity is one aspect that affects the hydraulic conductivity or the permeability. So those are some of the uh, factors that can affect the hydraulic conductivity. Viscosity, if you remember what is viscosity, it's a word that you always say, but you don't know what it, or remember, you don't know, I don't know. Personally, people, or personally, not personally, people don't usually know what viscosity means. But uh, it's a measure of the fluid resistance to a flow. That's that's a good definition. Then you can talk about shear, strain, and some of things, but basically, less viscous, more viscous. That's the, that's the bottom line. If the fluid has more viscosity, then it, the, the permeability is gonna be less, or the coefficient of permeability is gonna be affected less. Uh, the viscosity is affected by the temperature, and if you see just this uh, chart, this is a chart that is telling you how the dynamic viscosity changes for water with respect to the temperature. As the temperature is increasing, the viscosity is decreasing, as you can see here, you see? So we have to take into account the viscosity when we deal with uh, hydraulic conductivity. And we have to talk the same language everywhere. So there is an standardization, there is a standard of 20 degrees Celsius to express the coefficient of permeability. That means that wherever we're working, we have, if the temperature is different, we have to convert that and express it as 
what would be the permeability at 20 degrees Celsius. How do you do that? You just apply correction factor. This is the viscosity at the actual temperature. This is the viscosity at 20 degrees Celsius multiplied by the permeability that you obtain. You can use the conversion factor in the table 7.2 from your book. You just read the temperature here and apply the correction factor. Now, how do you measure permeability? There are several ways of measuring permeability. Uh, you can measure permeability in the lab, and there are different procedures for that, or you can measure permeability on the field also. If you measure permeability on the lab, you can use, let's say, the constant head test or the falling head test. Those are the two most commonly used methods for measuring permeability. And in the field, there are several methods. There are several pumping test methods, several different types. We're going to explain one. There are different borehole infiltration tests also. Uh, but the whole idea is that you get the whole picture, the big picture about this. So in the laboratory, we're going to use, for measuring permeability, basically an equipment that is called permeometer. And permeometer is this apparatus here. A ruler, of course, we have a scale here to measure the height. Vacuum source, yes, some method recommend to use a vacuum source for that. We are not using the vacuum source, but we are getting used. What would be vacuum source? Because we don't want air trap. Remember, the soil has to be full saturated. And if soil is full saturated, that means there's no air, everything is water. But we, we can get rid of the air in different ways. A scale, a watch or a stopwatch, thermometer and filter. A, the, these apparatus, let me see if I can switch this here. Uh, these apparatus, uh, .com. Yeah, these apparatus, is, it looks something like this. This is the permeometer. And remember the picture that I showed you before, the inclined tube, Bernoulli, like this? That is the same thing. This is the apparatus. Basically, uh, what we're going to do, we have. see that in the bottom you have that that's a porous stone what porous stone because I need something that contains the soil and at the same time uh, it's containing the soil but it's letting the water pass through so then you have another porous stone so you put the soil sample here you put the other porous stone of course this is gonna be somewhere in between now it's gonna fall okay and you're gonna have the porous stone the so like a sandwich porous stone, soil, porous stone. Um, you have a spring here on the top because that spring is just going to make sure that if you uh, lose any type of uh, air or the soil gets uh, accommodated, it's going to be also uh, contained. And then you put this, the lid, on top of this and put the screws. This is screws here. You put the screws and fix it. Once you do that, we have to be sure that this soil is uh, completely saturated. The way you, you uh, ensure that this is completely saturated, uh, you're going to have this procedure in the lab and you're going to see it. Okay, this is just a quick quick review. So you, put you, you connect this to the water source. Remember, you have soil in this part. You connect this to the water source. This valve is supposed to be closed. This valve is supposed to be closed at first. You put water here entering, you open this valve, you open this valve first, and let this to sat saturate completely. The water is going to come out from this point. Of course, this is going to be a standing up. So you saturate the sample from top to bottom. And you let the water, the water run for a certain amount of time. The water has to come clear at the other end. And remember, you have hoses and everything, so you have to tap. That's why they, they, the vacuum pump is, but we don't use it. So you have to tap the hose in order to get rid of all the air contained, etc., etc., etc. Once this is saturated and the water starts coming clear, then you invert the process and then you make the water come from here to the bottom one. Uh, basically, that's the preparation of the equipment. Uh, and what we're going to do is this. The first test is called constant head test. And the idea for the constant head test is create exactly that. Create a difference in head constant between the beginning, the, between the first uh, 
part and the second part, the, the, the starting and the end of the sample. Look at this, this is more clear than the other one. So if you have this uh, apparatus, basically what you're doing is you are opening the water, this is the porous stone, this is the soil, this is the other porous stone. And the head between this point and this point, aka beginning and end of the soil, has to be constant. This is the head, this is constant. That requires some adjustments, so you have to open more water here, close more the water here, and of course you have to have a discharge of water because the water is going to pass through and it's going to go somewhere. So once you ensure that this head is constant, and of course this sample is completely saturated and this water coming out of here is clear, then you can calculate the total amount of water if you want to. You don't calculate it actually, you measure it. But the total amount of water collected here, once you have that head, you just start time and say, okay, start, collect. Once you, uh, the total amount of water collected here, remember, it's gonna be the cross-sectional area times V. Remember that if you multiply cross-sectional area of what? Of this soil sample, this cross-sectional area. But A times V was the small Q, it was the seepage, the small Q and the time. Another, word of another way of expressing this V, according to Darcy's law, is K times I. K, coefficient of permeability or hydraulic conductivity, multiplied by the hydraulic gradient. And the hydraulic gradient is what? Hydraulic gradient is difference in head, which in this case is constant, divided by the length that the flow is crossing. Difference in head, from here to here, because this is the difference between the head at the beginning and the head at the end, and the length of the soil sample, from here to here, that's the hydraulic conductivity. So when I put everything into the equation, like I have it now, I can just solve for K, and K is my coefficient of permeability for that soil. Anything else that we have to do? Yes, of course, there's something else that we have to do. What is the next thing that we have to do? Correct, by temperature because we don't know, remember the permeability has to be expressed at 20 degrees Celsius. And we don't know what is the permeability, the, the, the temperature. We have to measure the temperature, go to the table and correct it. Let's look at this example. In this example, a constant head experiment was conducted at the temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. It's not temperature of the ambient, it's temperature of the water, of course, the fluid temperature. Now. We have the diameter of the sample, remember the permeameter, the diameter of the sample in the permeameter, you have the difference in head, that's the constant head that you are measuring, 75 millimeters and 100 millimeters is the length in between the, I took the difference in head measurement. This is a different type of permeameter, not the same one that, that I showed you. And we measure the outflow once that head is constant we measure the outflow to be one liter every minute. One liter is PQ, every minute is T. Q divided by T is a small Q. And we have to apply the formula. What is the formula? Small PQ, one liter, T every minute, aka 60 seconds. L, what is L? L is the length of the flow. What is H? H is the difference in head. What is A? A is the cross-sectional area of this flow. So basically, you can express it in this small Q, and this is small Q, uh, the hydraulic gradient first, is 75. Why 75? Because it's this H divided by this L. The Q, a small Q, is the outflow, one liter, 1,000 cubic centimeters, every minute, 60 seconds, converted, cubic meter per second. A, cross-sectional area, pi r square. Take it to square meters also to have a coherence in the units. Put everything together in the formula. This is the permeability expressed in meter per second. After that, what do you do? Well, after that, what you have to do is correct by temperature. Table 7.2, factor for temperature equal 22 Celsius. 
as you can see here, 22 Celsius, read this value from the table 0 0.953, get this value, multiply by 0 0.953, and get the permeability expressed at 20 degrees Celsius. Straightforward, all of those experiments, all of those problems are uh, straightforward. And this is the constant head permeometer. Now you have the falling head permeometer. The falling head permeometer is similar also to the constant head permeometer. How similar? Well, similar in the fact that it uses the same equipment, but now we don't require a constant head. Reason for that, imagine that now you have a silty clay mixture. I'm not gonna wait 200 years. Of course, that was uh, too much in that uh, animation. And let's imagine that you have to wait, I don't know, three weeks for starting getting or collecting something. That's impossible. So basically, for that's for keeping the constant flow. Of course, I'm going to collect flow, but for keeping a constant flow there in that saturated soil. So what you do basically is that you set up a new, uh, an initial head with water after you saturated the sample, an initial uh, head of water, and measure how much time it takes from go from one point to a different point, from different elevations. Once you have that, this is basically what is happening here, you see? And the way this is uh, derived, this equation is derived, is in this way. For this sample, at any point, I know the seepage is KIA, Kia, remember Kia, the car, non-pay advertising, advertisement. So this Q is KIA, K permeability, I hydraulic gradient, A cross-sectional area for the soil specimen, hydraulic gradient, H divided by L. What is H in this case? H is just the difference in head at any time, because we are trying to make this at any time. Uh, L is the length of the soil. Now, let's check the standpipe now. What is going to be the seepage flowing through this standpipe at any time? Well, definitely, we don't have this. It's going to be one, because there's nothing avoiding this here. So the only thing that I'm going to have is just the hydraulic gradient on the pipe, which is the HDT, differential of H, differential of time, multiplied by area. That's going to be the seepage. Uh, why is a seepage? Because remember, the H multiplied by area is the differential of volume, and the volume divided by T is what is seepage. So, what is important here is this: the water that passes through this standpipe, or the flow of water, or the seepage of water passing through this standpipe, is going to be exactly the same seepage that passes through the flow to the to the sample. Why? Because we have flow continuity. And this is the flow continuity equation. There is not any loss of flow for any point here in this system. So the flow has to be the same. So that means that I mix, I meant this and this to be equal. And the only thing that I have to do is reorganize these, these differentials here, and do the integration between the first time, which is times instant zero, let's say, and time two, and between H1 and H2 also which is the difference in head that I'm measuring. So once I do that and I reorganize, I obtain this equation, and once I solve for K, then I get the hydraulic permittive, uh, conductivity for a falling head permeometer. This, remember, you have to correct it also based on temperature for due to the viscosity. You can find the equation expressed in this way. A, what is A? The cross-sectional area of the st standpipe. What is L? The length of the sample. What is H1 and H2? H1 and H2 are just the first head, the, the first measurement, and the second measurement in the head. What is T? T is the difference between the first T also, which is zero, and the second one. So basically you have a, this equation, and you have the, log, the natural logarithm, or, yeah, or Nepper logarithm. A, but you can get this expression. You can see it also expressed, I think, is 2.303 log, decimal log, but decimal log and natural logarithm are, are uh, related in that way. So you can find the correspondence between lo la 
natural logarithm and decimal logarithm, which is E, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, what is the problem with this, uh, or what is my problem? I don't say that it's a problem. What is my issue with these lab methods for determining permeability? My issue is that you are taking a sample from the field. You are taking the soil from the field. You are disturbing the soil in every possible sim way that you can imagine. You are taking it to the lab. You are trying to make it saturated again. What if that particular soil wasn't a representation of what I have? close by? What if I had different layers of soil? What if at the disturbance that I did when I took that soil was so much that affected the whole thing? All of those are big ifs. So that's why uh, some cases, you of course you do the lab because you do it, all the other analysis also, but you have to be really careful with these analysis in the lab. Sometimes you go to the field and I'm not going to go through this today, but I'm going to introduce at least the topic. Uh, you go to the field, and in the field, you can do what is called a drawdown test. And um, basically, if this is the case, and I want to calculate the permeability of this soil, in this case, you have two confining layers, but you have the aquifer here, you have the soil here. I instead of disturbing the sample, I place my apparatus on the field and I start pumping out from the water from the field. So basically what it work, the way it works would be something like this. Let's say that this is the water table here. You're gonna drill a pumping hole and the soil is not disturbed around it. And this is one of the ways, there are several ways. In the way that I'm gonna explain you, we're gonna uh, drill two observation wells also. Now, this could be two observation wells, this could be one observation well, this could be no observation wells, just the pumping well. But the one I'm using right now uses two observation wells. Basically, once you have this pumping well here, you start pumping water out. When you start pumping water out of here, what is happening with this aquifer is that our aquifer is that the water table, which is this one, is gonna be impacted by that pumping, localized impacting, of course. And the water table is gonna be rolled down like this. And this is the cone of depression, the draw down line. Now, of course, at this point where, where the pump is located, you're gonna have a bigger disturbance than at this point and at this point, and there's gonna be some radius that, that's not gonna be affected at all the water table. That's, that's logic, right? But you're gonna have a complete area around this radius, which is gonna be uh, disturbed. And you can measure, because whatever this is going down here, is directly related with whatever I'm pumping out, which is directly related with the water coming through the sides and through the incline and through everywhere. If I have three layers of soil different, all the three layers are gonna be combined. And whatever water I'm gonna have here pump out is gonna be like a measure of the combined permeability of this soil. That's basically what you do. Uh, just to finish today's lecture, uh, what you're gonna do is, uh, you have to have, when you do a drawdown test like this, you have to have a well-defined water table, and you have to have at least one confining boundary, which you most of the time, or for not saying always you have. You can have one confining boundary or two confining boundaries, and you have to be able to pull water out of the table at a constant flow. If you can create this, then there is no problem. You are gonna get a very good value of permeability. Next class, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna guide you through how the derivation work, and we're gonna do some examples 
uh, using the draw down the drawdown test for unconfined and for confined aquifer. See you next class, guys.